We need to cleanse the system. When we now release the lockdowns, what's actually going to happen to the economy? Will everybody go back to the way it was before? What COVID is, 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 is an accelerant. It is simply pushing forward and accelerating a trend that was already in motion. COVID-19 has created immense change all over the world. No one has been left untouched by its impact. What will be the short-term and long-term effects for the households, corporates and governments who drive our economies? What will follow? Will we see a swift recovery or will we face a wave of global bankruptcies? Is deflation or inflation on the horizon or both? And finally, what does the data tell us about what our future world might look like? In this series, we ask experts in business and finance from across the globe about our prospects in a rapidly evolving environment in which multiple waves of infection could continually threaten a road to recovery. When countries across the world started to impose strict lockdown conditions, consumption collapsed across many sectors. Cash flows fell, putting pressure on corporate balance sheets, which in many cases were already saddled with excess debt. Government stepped in with support packages, but access to these has been uneven. Some businesses have taken advantage of technology to thrive in the new environment. But for many companies, the corona crisis has kick-started a vicious cycle of falling consumption, wage cuts and job losses, leading to further falls in consumption. Whilst many big businesses have been able to access government support, many small businesses face the threat of bankruptcy. The sudden decline in the household consumption saw a simultaneous concentration of business into a few large hands. There have been clear winners and losers, which could lead to a permanent change in the corporate landscape. There's going to be an aspect of deleveraging that rather than being involuntary is completely and wholly voluntary. This is, this is corporate America's worst nightmare. There's just more digital. There's just more uh, you know, online. Everything is online. Entertainment, um, uh, shopping, all of that. Is, it's, just, it's, it's dramatically hastened the move to all of these new, um, these new behaviors. We're expecting a 160% increase in e-commerce purchases from new or low frequency users. So I think this is uh, a significant uh, number in terms of uh, new opportunities, new ways to reach consumers. So anytime there's an opportunity to reach consumers in new ways, that, that's significant for, uh, for companies. What COVID is, 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 is an accelerant. It is simply pushing forward and accelerating a trend that was already in motion. And that's what we should, that, that's how we should look at what COVID has done. If you had a bad business model before and you were kind of getting by, you've been exposed. You're going to go out of business. And again, the Fed can postpone it, but they cannot, they can't, they can't postpone it indefinitely. There is this ever greater dependence on a smaller number of vast capitalization, mostly technology businesses, that are the winners. Um, but a society cannot exist on a handful of technology companies. They don't create enough jobs. They don't pay enough taxes. You know, in the old days, we used to say change is a constant. Uh, but I would think, I would say now that change is exponential. We have been talking about digital for the last five, six, seven, eight years. And all of a sudden, we're seeing the talk turn into action. It probably doesn't come as any surprise to hear that the hospitality industry, uh, you know, hotel, travel and tourism, um, big swaths of the retail uh, real estate segment are getting just absolutely hammered, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a bloodbath. Lots of small shops are gonna be dramatically affected because they can only have one or two people inside them. Uh, you know, how long are people going to queue in order to get into a shop? Well, not that long, so I suspect they're going to shift online permanently for the duration, maybe forever. Retail's a mess. It really, that, that's probably where we're going to see the most uh, pain in, in the real estate market because it was already struggling prior to COVID. I think last year there was 
something like 9,800 store closings. And the latest forecast I saw is suggesting that there could be almost 25,000 in 2020. And you're hearing statistics like one in five restaurants isn't going to reopen. This will definitely be a permanent change as we're already seeing signs that the consumer is gravitating online and is feeling more at ease to fulfill these purchases because they know that they can rely on the cons on the retailer to have it deliver in a fast and efficient way and even in a safe manner to their households. Already retailers are telling us that they are receiving a new numbers of customers even four times the amount seen before the coronavirus, telling us that the omnichannel strategy is definitely building consumer loyalty, which will last even after the pandemic is over. That's the thing I don't think people understand. They're like, oh, COVID took them down. A lot of these hotel chains, uh, Hertz is a great example. That was a leveraged buyout from way back when. A lot of the places where private equity has been in corporate America, a lot of the places private equity has touched and run up their balance sheets to terrible levels, they're not going to recover. Well, restaurants will fall into roughly three categories. Uh, there will be those that are well-financed and have the resources to adjust their operating model and can trade and at least break even. Uh, there are those that um, will try to open up, uh, but will almost certainly lose money if they do, because they will not be able to reach uh, levels of trade given the restrictions that justify the extra costs of opening in terms of staff and utility costs and so forth. And then sadly, there will be a chunk, and who knows whether it's 5% or 25% of the total hotel, restaurant, bar, cafe, pub, etc. market that I fear will never reopen, uh, will not have the working capital, uh, cannot off pay off the accumulated arrears of liabilities, and we'll go out of business. The good news for the real estate industry in the segment is that we went into this pandemic on pretty solid uh, fundamentals. Occupancies were strong generally across most sectors. Uh, rents uh, and prices had been increasing steadily, you know, particularly in the for sale housing market. There's something like 300 billion of dry powder in, in the real estate private equity space. And just to put it into context, I think volume in 2019 was less than 600 billion. So if you put any kind of leverage on that 300 billion, we have like two or three years of dry powder uh, just sitting there. So it's, it's one of these things where my own view is you, distress doesn't come when you have a situation like that. You need a situation like 08 where liquidity is dramatically and quickly removed from the marketplace before you start to see real pain. The crash in cash flows has adversely impacted many companies. Government loans have plugged the gap, but many companies already had excessive pre-COVID debt levels. Some corporates with weak models, but with access to funding will stay afloat. Many smaller businesses may not survive these extreme circumstances. One of the main lessons, of course, is, I mean, we learn it every time there's a problem, is stay away from companies with too much debt. I mean, how many times has, has the market learned this lesson? Hundreds of times. Well, we're learning it again. Uh, and if you want to survive something like this, you better go into it with low debt, and you better go into it with customers who have low debt. Uh, because if your customer gets in trouble, you have trouble. It's industry and sector, of course, but I think within industry and sector, you have to look at companies that just weren't, weren't prepared for this. They didn't have balance sheets that were really in any way resilient and could handle a shock. Forget a shock like this, which is, you know, once in a lifetime shock um, or once in a generation, let's hope. It's nothing more than that. But, you know, they weren't ready for even just a downturn. If you look back at the prior crisis, a lot of the, the, the debt outstanding was on the consumer side of the balance sheet and not just on the corporates. And if you look today, the, the trend... Um, that's effectively exactly the same uh, notional amount that's now on the corporate side. Um, about, there's about $10 trillion of non-financial uh, corporate debt, about half of that is triple Bs. Balance sheets are mostly atrocious, and we saw corporations uh, over the past 10 years you know, taking cheap credit from central banks and basically uh, participating heavily in corporate share buybacks. And then as soon as things turn south, uh, you know, they're going back to that same same government looking for bailouts. The amount of money that's gone into the bond market in particular, which is the corollary to the stock market, has allowed companies to go out and, and raise money like never like 
like we haven't seen since the, the, um, the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009. The fact that the capital markets have been wrenched open and we've already seen over a trillion dollars worth of corporate debt issuance, that is going to postpone the inevitable. That's fine. But it's not going to provide insolvent companies with good business models when what they've done to resolve their insolvency is make themselves more insolvent. It, the math just falls apart. But if we look at the development over the past 10 years, I would say that it's been a very, very uneven development in corporate bond space in, in Europe, uh, because you have countries like Italy and Spain where debt, debt levels, they are actually coming down over the past 10 years. But if you look at France, that's definitely the, um, the country I would worry about. Uh, if you look at the corporate uh, debt to, um, to GDP, it's around 150%, 150%, so a very high number. I think that, that we're going to have a lot of corporations that come out of this with stronger balance sheets, with a greater capacity to produce cash flow, and meaner than they've ever been. And I say meaner on many levels, metaphorically. And just having a tight ship cost construct. In this time of COVID, we see one big change, which is a switch from looking for optimization and yield to actually looking at um, ensuring that they have safety and soundness. So um, how do they do that? They are... Um, realizing that where they don't have digital tools and the ability to have visibility on their cash flows, they are quickly looking at how they can institute them. We need to cleanse the system of, you know, people who had bad ideas for companies and bad companies that are, you know, bad operators and don't have profitability. Capitalism does work. What doesn't work is cronyism where we give handouts and bailouts to people who have proven that their model doesn't work. Buybacks and dividends have been a key driver of returns for listed companies over the last decade. Companies that have taken government loans may now be restricted from purchasing their own shares, whilst governments will be looking at ways that they can claw back some of their expenditures. I think buybacks now are a political event. Um, you know, the airline industry has 97% of its cash flow that's being used that's been used to, to, to fund these buybacks and now the government's giving them a bailout. So it's now become a, a political event um, that going forward is, is likely going to, uh, it's likely going to cease. Corporate balance sheets are in the worst state really they've ever been in. And there are those that say, yeah, but you know, those that have debt, they have a lot of cash too. No, again, it's the haves and have nots. Apple has a lot of cash because they actually sell products that, that people want. But there are a whole bunch of companies that have negative sales growth. They've been borrowing to pay dividends. They've been borrowing to do stock buybacks. Look, 42% of companies in the S&P 1500, okay, 1500 biggest companies, 42% can't service their debt with their EBITDA. Forget paying back their debt. They can't even service the debt and we're at zero interest rates. Suspend is a really popular word right now. We're gonna freeze our dividend. We're gonna suspend our buybacks, but you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. It's coming back just as soon as everything gets calm again. And cause our lobbyists have assured us, they've talked to everybody in DC that we're gonna be able to pump up the buyback machine again. You know, if the argument is that that we decided as governments to lock things down and we're gonna bail you out, we're gonna help the small guys. Then the corollary to that is if you've done well, then you've also been given a handout in a sense by the government. So I would not be surprised to see something like a windfall tax. We also see questions about windfall taxes. Are there businesses out there which have um, made a significant profits as a result of all of this? Now that's quite difficult to do and quite difficult to identify and is very specific country by country. It needs very subtle planning because I think if you use a blunt instrument, the risk is you drive away investment. It has unintended consequences in terms of behaviours and so forth and job creation. And right now, it's probably not the moment to be increasing many taxes on business because we need investment. We need companies to preserve rather than scrap jobs. And um, we need to incentivise companies to uh, 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 keep hiring rather than the reverse. Businesses have taken advantage of furlough schemes to offset the loss of revenues and to keep their operations ticking along. There remains a real risk that some wage cuts and job losses become permanent, leading to a further decline in consumption and another round of wage cuts. I, I guess already before we entered the corona crisis, we had sort of a profit margin 
um, squeeze already on the cards in, in Europe, uh, simply as a result of, of um, less good uh, trading opportunities worldwide. Uh, so with profit margins being squeezed, uh, and they're definitely going down year over year uh, this year, then it's very unlikely that you hire a lot of people. Um, so that's point number one on the wage growth front. Uh, I guess with as many people sent home as, as right now um, and with as many unemployed as we will likely have in, in the second part of this year, you should expect wage growth uh, of close to 0% over the next couple of years. Uh, I mean, no wage growth at all. Even in economies like countries like Sweden, where the government took a relatively relaxed view, in fact, business has contracted dramatically. Uh, people haven't gone to restaurants and gone out and traveled in the way they used to. Travel has been massively disrupted everywhere. So to some extent, it's a pervasive phenomenon, almost independent of the lockdowns. Um, and so it, this raises a very big question, which is when we now release the lockdowns, what's actually going to happen to the economy? Will everybody go back to the way it was before? I think very, very strongly in most places, no. There may be a question of like, if you furlough those workers, do you need them to come back? Are they going to come back? If you've installed the capital equipment that you need um, to automate some of that work. Countries around the world, monetary authorities around the world, governments around the world are looking to support uh, populations. And the way of doing that is to issue debt. I think at some point there will need to be more equity infused into the economy. And there'll have to be uh, innovative ways of doing that, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, small to medium-sized enterprises. Um, I think there needs to be some financial innovation there to allow for money, equity specifically, to reach uh, small businesses. That McKinsey study that said that a third of the American work workforce was going to lose its jobs to automation slowly, that's been expedited by force, by COVID. Many sectors which saw the greatest decline in activity, such as leisure, will recover. But the corporate sector has seen an incredible acceleration of existing trends, with a concentration of business into online industries. Trends that would have played out over years have taken place over a few months. Small businesses are struggling to access loans. Many are faced with bankruptcy. In the meantime, central banks have enabled many highly indebted and inefficient businesses to survive, and this could stifle future competition. Rising inequality has led to a rising sense of disquiet amongst households and workers. In the following episode, we will look at the government response and some of the consequences of their actions.